So the intro to HTTP, uh, we all know it, right? Because we're all on the internet all the time. Everybody that's on their phone right now is using HTTP. So, and what does it stand for? The HTML tube technology protocol. And where is this? Yeah, the cat thing, yeah, tubes everywhere, yeah, yeah no. So, okay, the actual HTTP, um, hypertext transfer protocol. And according to Wikipedia, the, you know, definitive source of all knowledge. Uh, it stands for, uh, excuse me, hypertext is structured text that uses logical links, aka hyperlinks, between nodes containing text. HTTP is the protocol to exchange or transfer hypertext. That's really drawn out to say we send stuff back and forth. Like, we use links to send shit. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so as far as like, the piece of HTTP that really ties into REST, uh, HTTP communicates using verbs, aka methods, uh, such as, well, we're gonna touch on them in a second, but uh, different uh, methods to, you know, conduct business, so to speak, across the internet, if we're receiving a web page or sending data or whatnot. So let's take a look at those. So some of the methods we have, I uh, get, post, put, patch, delete and lots more because there's, you know, extensions and extensions to the protocol year after year. So let's uh, dive into them a little bit. So a get request, uh, that requests or retrieves a record. So um, as we go through these methods, um, I've put uh, some <clears throat> SQL equivalents in here, which seems totally irrelevant to HTTP, but it does tie in later on, so bear with me. So. And a get request is kind of like a select statement in SQL, if, if you will, like we're getting data. So a post request creates a record, or in SQL, and, um, it might be an insert. Uh, the record um, <clears throat> must not already exist. And I'll say this a couple times as we go through, but this is all according to the proper standard and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> what's actually done is up to the developer. Um, Anybody that's writing a web server can write whatever they want. Uh, they can, you know, if they want to retrieve web pages using posts constantly and post between every single page, they probably shouldn't be a web developer, but, you know, they, they can do it. Um, in my early web development days, or rest days, I should say, using uh, Flask, I, you know, I saw you can, uh, <clears throat> specify different actions based on what type of request you have. If it's a get request, do this. If it's a post, do this, et cetera. There's, you know, you can do whatever you want. That's the beauty of development, well, in theory. So, okay, um, a put request uh, updates a record. Um, <clears throat> if it doesn't exist, it creates a new record. So it's like an insert or an update in SQL. A patch, um, partial modification of existing record, uh, SQL update, and again, the, you know, the SQL comparison is not you know, f foolproof here, but uh, <clears throat> so delete, I think we can guess what that does, right? Deletes records. Okay, so some examples here. Um, so if we're, say, loading reddit.com, which Reddit's gonna be our example today because that's the main site I'm constantly on all the time, so. Uh, a get request is if you're loading up a web page. So now I'm logging into my account. That's a post request. I'm sending my account data to the server. Um, if I'm changing my password, uh, that's a put. I'm updating that complete record for the password because if we change a password, it's changing the entire piece, not just like one character if you're you know, storing passwords properly. Um, say I'm modifying my email address, now I am changing like from .com to .net and the rest of the data can stay there. That could, in theory, be a patch. Delete account, can anybody guess? Delete, okay. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> now that we've gone through HTTP, let's talk about REST. So it stands for Representational State Transfer and this, according to Wikipedia, uh, communication between client and server using uniform resource identifiers, URIs, and HTTP methods to identify objects and perform actions or functions. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and the HTTP headers can uh, <clears throat> contain authorization information. So, essentially, what this means is we're using those 
HTTP calls to <clears throat> uh, function as an API over the internet. So rather than saying, rather than using some advanced API, we can say, like my example with Flask before, uh, <clears throat> if a get request goes to this URL, perform this action. If it's a post request, do this. If it's this URL, do that. And based on the path of the URL, it really is, can be object oriented. We can say like uh, the user path, like reddit.com slash user slash whomever, and we're gonna get to that in a second. That's an object and then perform various methods on that object once you start you know, going in a path past that name itself. So an example here, say I wanna view my account, uh, get reddit.com slash u, that's the user specifier there, slash a green bhm. Now, if I wanna view my comments, so that would be another get request to my user account uh, and then slash comments. So like I said, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's looking at say a comments property of my user object. Now, <clears throat> if I wanna view my messages, uh, you know, I can't, nobody, excuse me, not everybody can just log in and view my private messages, hopefully. Uh, you need some kind of authentication and you can either send that data in the post or you can send it in an authorization header. So that might be get reddit.com slash message slash inbox and now <clears throat> we're going to the message path rather than the user path and so that's a different type of object or a different, uh, <clears throat> a different database that I might be looking at or what have you. Okay, so if I wanna view my sent messages, um, again, requires authorization. Uh, another get request to the message object, say, and then the uh, sent path. Send a message and we'll keep, you know, a couple more of these, so post. Um, so you see, retrieving data, get request, sending data, post requests. And uh, we'll go into uh, <clears throat> a little more program specific stuff right now. So uh, here's my username, that's a user object. Now uh, the get request for that might be the equivalent of uh, a green BHM that is the instance of my user object dot get profile. So we're calling a method based on the path of the URL. Now if I want to view my comments, we showed the comment path, um, that's a comments object. Now it's a property of my user object. So the get request for that might be the equivalent of a green bhm dot comments dot get comments. And the post request might be make comments and then pass the comment text and whatever other metadata as a parameter to that call. So is everybody see sort of how this equates like path and, and HTTP method equals uh, you know, normal API call. And once you sort of uh, figure this out, it makes programming for a mobile app or what have you a lot easier because now you can really see, okay, I'm designing, uh, again, Flask, say I wanna perform this function. So design uh, whatever method within the get for this path and now, um, <clears throat> now my app just calls this uh, URL with a get request and um, <clears throat> my function happens. So again, continuing through this, uh, the inbox might be a list of message objects and the get request might be my user object dot get messages and message slash compose might be, uh, <clears throat> where we, there we go, uh, send message. So we're creating a new message object um, via the send message method of the a green bhm object instance. Okay, so JSON, uh, it's the preferred data format for REST. Um, I've seen all kinds of different data formats used, but it's the most readable in my opinion, and it's also very lightweight. So it stands for JavaScript object notation, and all it really is is key value pairs, and this is the same thing as a Python dictionary. So they're signified by curly brackets or braces. And the, as far as the values go, they can be text 
lists or key value pairs. So we can contain other types of data within this, but it's all text-based. So here's an example. So my username, and you see the curly brace uh, starting, um, the key is username and the value is aGreenBHM. Uh, Twitter is the key, at aGreenBHM, you get the idea. Now here we got comments and you see the square bracket next to it, that signifies a list and or maybe an array depending on what your language of choice is. So now we've got a list of different comment objects and within that and then you see the first curly brace, um, then the ID and then the text. So we have an, uh, that's a, a comment object and then the comma signifies the next object in a list. Then we have another comment object and we can have as many of those as there might be. So, <clears throat> Yeah, so all of this gets passed in the body of the request itself, and everything is good. Um, we can also pass uh, data, say, just in the URL itself. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times with PHP, you see that, you know, question mark, uh, key equals what have you, ampersand, and, you know, you have a ridiculously long URL with all kinds of parameters. So, um, or you can do a combination of those two. Maybe the, maybe the authentication goes in the URL and then the rest of the request is in the data. Again, it's up to you developing the app and the server that uh, corresponds with it. So what are some benefits of REST? Uh, the readable design. It's easy to determine the function uh, based on the URL. Like we said, based on the path, it's really easy to determine what's happening here. The first piece of that uh, user account path uh, my username, okay, we're looking at the user object, then slash comments, okay, we're looking at the comments of that user object. It's lightweight, we were just talking about how the, uh, you know, it's really focused on JSON and text, preferably, and yeah, it really passes as little as possible over the web, so because so many mobile apps are using REST to communicate, that's really important when you have limited data. It's also stateless, meaning you don't need to keep a constant connection with the server. Every request has authorization data. So that way <clears throat> the server doesn't need to keep track of who's uh, connected and logged in and all that. If you speak to the server with a valid authorization header, or whatever method of authenticating, that's it. Okay, some, some, some caveats of REST. There's no 100% uniform way to design a RESTful API. Um, there are some best practices, but it's really, again, up to whoever is designing the system. Um, <clears throat> I've seen all kinds of craziness out there. So uh, they don't always conform to the HTTP method design, and uh, post and put are swappable a lot of times. I mean, maybe they're not supposed to be, but people do uh, do whatever they feel like. Um, and an example on guilty as well, uh, rather than putting uh, authentic authentication data in an authorization header, I made, uh, <clears throat> I made requests, I made some get requests, post requests, that way I could send my auth authentication data to the server, and then the return, or excuse me, the response to that request was whatever normally would come from a get response. You know, for my very limited app, it didn't make a difference, but you know, um, <clears throat> it's gonna be different no matter what you look at. Like I said, that's probably not best practice, but it was my first REST app, so you'll have to give me a, a pass on that one. Okay, so talk about REST hacking. So it's, an, it's a great attack vector because you talk about mobile apps, web apps, what have you. It's an undocumented, a lot of the times, internet-facing API, um, you know, people have all these apps that <clears throat> are being designed by people that don't know anything about programming, don't know security, most importantly, and they're putting, a lot of times, sensitive information publicly exposed and hoping that nobody takes a look at it, and the story that we're going to be getting into is exactly that. So the fact that it's undocumented helps uh, sometimes because, you know, security by obscurity, oh, we didn't document this, so nobody's going to hack us because they don't know how to use our crazy API that, you know, is really not that crazy. <laughs> so oftentimes it's misconfigured or it's missing a security. Um, the thing we're going to be looking at is both of those. 
And because of the readable design by nature, REST APIs are easy to determine what's going on if they're undocumented, but you look at the traffic, which anybody with a you know, Wireshark or some of the other tools we're gonna to talk about can do this, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on here. And if you're working with a system that doesn't have security or is misconfigured, now that you know how the system works, you can exploit it. So yeah, just said that. There's lots of tools to assist, such as uh, man in the middle proxy, that was the one I started with, but uh, there's some better tools than that for what I'm looking to accomplish, such as, or excuse me, so man in the middle proxy intercepts uh, web traffic and uh, it can do SSL as well. Now, there's nothing crazy black magic-y about man in the middle proxy. You have a self-signed certificate, uh, you're man in the middle in traffic, you're gonna throw SSL errors unless you trust the self-signed certificate already. There's, we're not finding a way around SSL. Um, some of the better suited tools for this type of thing, uh, Burp Suite and Zap as well. Uh, both uh, trap, all kinds of stuff you can do with those, but uh, traffic analysis tools and um, they got like web spiders built in and, and lots of different f uh, functionality. They're both included in Kali by default. Actually, all, all three of those are included in Kali. Um, the last two there, you can intercept traffic and modify it. Uh, Man in the Middle Proxy can do that as well, but I, I feel like Man in the Middle Proxy is meant more to do that uh, in an automated sense, whereas uh, I like using Burp um, for manually doing this stuff, just analyzing uh, each packet as it comes through. And same for that. Um, the advanced REST uh, client is just a Chrome extension that I use that um, <clears throat> I found it helpful. You just, you know, I don't need the whole uh, burp suite or anything like that. If I just want to send some uh, requests to a RESTful API, I just load this thing up, type a few things in, and there you go. Um, also, uh, IDEs have them. My favorite one is PyCharm. It has a uh, REST client built into it, which was really helpful when you're uh, developing software that's using REST, you can test it right there. Okay, so story time, right? So this is called you know, uh, hacking with REST for love, right? So what is the, the love piece? We're gonna get into that, so we'll set the scene. So I was using a mobile app, I was, excuse me, a mobile dating app called JSwipe, and similar to Tinder, it's focused for uh, Jewish folks, and um, <clears throat> so for those of you guys that don't know Tinder, it's a location-based, dating app where uh, people in your general vicinity will show up and you either say you like them or you don't and then you move on and you set search radiuses and stuff like that and uh, based on geolocation, uh, you know, you find people and you move on and we'll get into that. So I'm getting more and more frustrated, um, not fully because my dating life was awful, but uh, the main reason the app sucks, it's a total POS um, in particular. So uh, frequently entire message threads were reloading, like, oh, and really slowly. So uh, I open up the app, oh, I have a message. Oh, look, here's every message coming through again. What's up? Um, messages randomly not coming through, like I prefer all of them to come through rather than none of them to come through. Um, so that was annoying too, but also, Again, it's supposed to be like close. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> apparently Ohio is closer to Raleigh than I thought. So, and it wasn't like one random person. It was like lots and lots of them. All of a sudden I was in the Midwest. So anyway, uh, okay, so I'm getting frustrated. You know, I'm flipping the table and what's wrong with the app? Like what's what's happening here like i think this it was like a saturday morning i'm like having some coffee trying to you know enjoy my weekend the little time i get off and just trying to talk to somebody and it's not happening like i finally got somebody to talk to me like why can't i actually talk to them so dating life's not going anywhere getting frustrated blah 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 so I turn to IT and security. Let's see what we can do with this. Um, let's figure out why this app sucks. Like, what's going on here? And, okay, we're gonna talk about what I discovered. So, here are the tools that I used. Um, I used my Android phone, or they have uh, em plenty of emulators as well. I particularly like Jenny Motion, which is uh, free for, like, personal use. Um, 
somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Android SDK recently came out with like a new emulator that's a lot faster than the old one was. But uh, a year or so ago when I was doing this, the official one was pretty slow, whereas Jenny Motion was pretty darn fast. Um, I used man in the middle proxy. Uh, again, uh, burp or zap or any tool like that would do the job just as well. We just want to intercept traffic, maybe modify it, or at least just see what's going on. And the reason we couldn't use Wireshark, at least not to my knowledge, is because the traffic's encrypted. I know there's ways to view encrypted SSL traffic in Wireshark, but these other tools were more straightforward for doing what I wanted, which was just intercepting traffic from an app on my phone rather than from, say, like Chrome, which I think has, there's some way to do it with Chrome or other browsers, but not that I know for an app. So the only saving grace this app had was it was using SSL. Like, they don't get points for that, but it's better than nothing, <laughs> not by much. So um, <clears throat> I used uh, Jet. JetBrains uh, PyCharm, that's the Python IDE. It's my favorite one by far. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before that there's a REST, a REST client built into it. I use that as well, it was really helpful. I have my code up top, my REST client right below. I can test stuff out and then I can implement it into code. It's uh, really nice. Uh, there's so many other options out there though for REST clients, you pick whatever you'd like. Um, I use Python for writing this exploit like I just said. Um, <clears throat> so we need to figure out like what's going on on the network, um, what traffic is being generated, what network activity. So I, here's what I did. I set up man in the middle proxy on my computer, which was a lot harder to do on a Mac than I expected. I've always used it on Kali, but I didn't have a Kali, um, ISO with me and I didn't want to wait the four minutes to download one so this turned into a whole ordeal <laughs> but anyway so I recommend Cali if you're gonna do this uh, so like I said before man the middle proxy generates a self-signed certificate that it uses to re-encrypt traffic that it intercepts and decrypts so uh, in order to make the apps that you're using on your phone function properly, when you're using a self-signed certificate, you need to tell your phone to trust that self-signed certificate. Again, that was also more difficult than I would have thought, trying to find a way to like get an SSL certificate onto my phone. Like if I just downloaded it and copied it to the SD card, that's one thing, but actually getting an SSL certificate from a site on my phone without downloading some special app or something was surprisingly difficult. I mean, not hard, but... You know, not as easy it is as it is on a regular, you know, desktop OS. So, uh, some apps will throw SSL errors if, you know, you're not using a valid SSL certificate. Plenty of them don't. This, I, I don't know if this one did or not. I wasn't going to give it the chance. I, I really didn't want to be any more disgusted than I was when I figured the rest of this stuff out. But anyway, um, so best, uh, best idea to have a trusted SSL certificate. Also, uh, some apps now more and more are doing certificate pinning, which means that they're trusting only one particular certificate. It's either baked into the app, like trust this certificate and this certificate only, or the first uh, certificate that it sees, that's the one that it trusts moving forward. <laughs> there was nothing of the sorts with this app. I don't have to worry about that, but that's something you could run into if you're looking at um, apps or any, any really any program this these days I know the desktop Dropbox client does pinning all I had to do was then uh, use man in the middle proxy trust the SSL certificate and then just use the app I'm just exploring network traffic as it comes through so let's just do what I want to see and then we'll analyze the results and see what's happening so what did I find So the first thing I figured out was um, there's a third party backend, aka backend as a service, uh, being used for hosting data. They're not running their own servers and databases and all this stuff. They're just uh, using a third party uh, hosted solution. And this is parse.com. Now, looked at parse a little bit and it provides yeah, the stuff I just said as well as um, SDKs for all kinds of mobile web development or mobile app development. Um, 
They got bought out by Facebook a couple years ago, and if you're looking to develop an app, don't use them because they're being shut down this year. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I uh, actually used them for something after learning about them through this whole process. I wrote an app that I was like, okay, well, let's try this out. And then I get an email six months later, like, hey, we're shutting our service down. Like, here's all the, we're going to open source all of our stuff so you can host your own servers. I'm like, that's, that's great. The free app is now uh, requiring that I buy a server or something or maybe just, you know, siphon some server space off of the office or, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> So uh, they have a REST API used for data communication. That's the preferred method of using parse. Okay, so a get request on this app um, to get users. Um, so we're doing get parse.com and then, I don't know what the one is, but that was in all the queries, and then classes. It's, you know, we're looking at object-oriented stuff, a class, and then user, that is the default user object, not for this app, but for all parse stuff. Um, I found that out when I developed my own app on their platform. Um, depending on what you're doing here, you can that user piece might be something custom if you're making other types of classes. That's specific to parse. I'm sure there's different ways for different services. So if we wanna get a user or a list of users, and I think that this query is for multiple users, uh, you would do, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you would request that URL. Now, you can add optional query parameters. Now, go back to the uh, first few slides when I was equating HTTP methods to SQL statements. Now, it'll maybe make a little more sense. So, as part of this URL, you can add various SQL statements or S SQL parameters to the request. So, limit equals 1,000 that's the same as like limit 1000 in a SQL statement. And I talked about undocumented APIs. The beautiful thing about this was this was all documented, like because parse is public, um, all this stuff, I could just look at, uh, you know, their knowledge base or the wiki, whatever it was, and learn of all this stuff that I didn't see in traffic requests. So basically using more, using my knowledge about the service, I was able to exploit the lack of security that they put in place or excuse me, that the app developers put in place. So order equals created at, again, order by in SQL. So created at being the uh, account creation date for the users. Now, the limit 1,000, I'm selecting 1,000 users from the database. I'm not selecting a single user as I normally would. When I use the app normally and I told it next person, it did this request, with a username or object ID or something like that, or maybe you just said a limit one. Well, I found out, oh, you can just change that limit higher and higher and higher and get as many people as I want. Um, this is some more um, <clears throat> select um, limiting, if you will. So where equals created at is greater than 2013. I, I just chose that the app started in like 2014 or something, so I figured this is a good starting date. If I start here, um, I'll get everybody, I'll get that 1,000 users, uh, I'll get the first 1,000 users uh, that were created after 2013, and it's going to order it by the date that they were created. So, um, this part was really good. <laughs> User details. Th this was something that I read about uh, in the API. This. Um, this includes all kinds of information about the user, such as their, their preferences, their search radius, et cetera, like not just their username and their, you know, whatever other public information it is. This is like, show me your bank account information. Um, yeah, so let's go through that. So analyzing captured traffic. Uh, so there's two main endpoints, and I might have mixed these up from what it actually was, but the gist of it was a message endpoint and a user endpoint. It's fairly clear to see what those were. So there was an OAuth token used for authentication. Didn't really matter too much, except that I had to use that same token when I was testing this out using my REST client. Now the PyCharm REST client has a nice little place that you can put headers right there, so all I did was copy and paste, and there we go, now I'm authenticated. We're not checking like, you know, user agent or anything crazy like that. 
I mean, you could, but they didn't. So all I had to do was authenticate, and there I am. Now, so why was the message function so flaky? Why were they reloading like every time? They were passing the entire thread every time. I wasn't like, I wasn't like spazzing out, like this was actually happening. Everything was going each time and it was getting, you know, larger and larger every, uh, every message that was being sent. It wasn't incremental updates. So anyway, uh, why was the app suggesting that uh, people across the country were in my search radius, I don't know, because I abandoned that quickly because who cares after I found the next thing. So here's an example of the get response. Um, have some information here. This is all um, JSON and you can see uh, the first thing is like profile picture and it's got you know some random name of the picture and then a path, to a URL, excuse me, for the uh, user picture. And then other types of profile information. I said it was the, you know, the Jewish dating app, so profile was kosher. There you go. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so birthday, um, user search distance. Now, go back to the part where I was talking about the different uh, query parameters. Not only can you not only can you limit your results, but where that remember that greater than 2013, I can choose any of these profile items, anything here can be used as a search parameter. So where, um, what do we got here? Where birth date equals, say I want everybody that's born on my birthday. Well, I should add that in there. Where every, I want everybody that's, you know, X age. And here's another thing, um, another, or there, there was a lot of data that include user details that dumped like three pages worth of stuff that I had to break up into pictures so it would fit in a readable form for y'all. So anyway, let's see, say I wanna search for all the 25 year old females in the entire world, which um, at the time there were 250,000 users on this app. So all I have to do is where gender equals female and where age equals 25 and there you go. Now I have every Jewish woman on this app in the entire world, nice. So, um, <laughs> so there was a, a, a tiny additional design flaw. So, um, you know, you authenticate with Facebook, log in with Facebook, just like every good app these days. Um, so as part of that information, the Facebook ID was there, like your true identity. And considering this is like a semi-anonymous, like first name only uh, app, you know, seeing somebody's true identity is not good. But not the worst thing in the world, but not great. So here's a screenshot of that. Here's their Facebook ID. Uh, I could also query for that. Um, and you'll see that in just a sec. So another little piece of this puzzle, the real uh, shocker here was, um, what is this? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and by the way, uh, it's a location-based app, so it updates every few minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, the other, we talked about the search preferences. So what did I say before about like using information as the query parameters that I just saw? Um, now I can query for all these types of stuff and I can look for specific people or I can say I can find somebody on Facebook and now I can get their Facebook ID and say query for that. And I think I talk about that a few slides over so I'm going to hold my tongue for a second. There was one, I remember where I said I limit 1,000? Like so I got 1,000 users, that's a lot. But uh, there's no rate limiting. <laughs> so. So uh, no sleep statements, no pause, no nothing. Just loop over and over and over and over and over. What? So, <laughs> yeah. So using this, we <laughs> yeah we we had a little proof of concept. So using the information. An attacker could develop a program to query the database for the person matching a certain criteria, like I said, 25-year-old female, say, and take the, find their Facebook ID, and then I can look, look them up on Facebook, and then I can track their GPS coordinates that get updated every few minutes. I have a tracking app for people that fit whatever criteria I look for. And 
you're supposed to like initiate conversations with people in order to talk to, or sorry, you're supposed to match with them in order to be able to initiate conversation. Forget that. Like I can talk to people and not, I don't think there's a whole lot of Jews in Japan, but I suppose I could talk to somebody over there if I just send the right uh, query to, uh, you know, to the app via that URL. So, so that's basically what I did to the CEO. <laughs> So yeah, I, had, I, I, I was like, wow, this is pretty bad, but I need to have some fun with this first. So, so I found his Facebook ID. He's not, I mean, he's not super famous, but he was like, you know, making himself real public, publicizing this app and everything like that. So all I did was I found his, his name, I found his Facebook profile, and then there's websites out there that let you just take the uh, like Facebook username and punch it in and out gives you a Facebook uh, profile ID, which is just, I think now it's like an eight digit number or something like that. Um, so yeah, and then all I need to do is uh, that whole uh, get user where Facebook ID equals his Facebook ID, and now I know his GPS coordinates. Um, so I tracked him across the country for the weekend, like he was going to the Midwest for something. Maybe he was in Ohio, maybe that's why it kept showing up, I don't know. But uh, anyway, uh, I saved the data and you know, I wanted to be able to say, hey, look, I tracked you. Lots of people can do that. This wasn't hard to do. You probably need to fix this. Um, anyway, and then, oh, by the way, I also dumped 90,000 users before I said, okay, I think my concept is proved. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, no rate limiting, no nothing. So here's a dump, sorry, here's a code snippet of the DB dump code. And it's real easy, except I can't see it. Um, so we have the uh, URL, we get the created at parameter, and we're adding our authorization headers and <clears throat> the request success piece, that was just something I added to, uh, that was my own error checking to make sure my uh, requests were going through. Um, I created a little database, a SQLite database, that way I could properly store all my stolen information and then I queried for users created uh, after 2013, uh, June 23rd, um, include the user details, and uh, I don't see, oh, there it is, limit 1,000, order by the creation date. That's all on line 10, that URL right there. Um, so, and then, the re so what it's doing is it's going to this URL, it's getting 1,000 users uh, basically the first user to the 1,000th user, returning them to me, and then taking the date that that 1,000th user was created at and using that as the parameter for the next one. So now I get the next 1,000. And like I said, I got about 90,000 people before I decided to cut it off and realized I don't really need the rest of them. Anyway, so yeah, the, what is this like? I don't know. 30, not even, yeah, 30 some odd lines of code. <laughs> that, that was all that was needed. And I'm sure there's lots of extra junk here that was unnecessary. Okay, so here's a quick screenshot of man in the middle proxy, um, if you haven't used it before. Um, so what you see here, this is not the app that I was working with. This is a different mobile dating app that has the same problem. Um, before I gave a similar talk at one point, I was like, okay, well, they patched the hole on the app that I'm working with, but I wonder if anybody else does it. So I spent an hour downloading every dating app I could on my Android emulator and scanning the traffic, and then, oh, all of a sudden, oh yeah, this, this worked, no problem. So, uh, yeah, another app leaking GPS coordinates, awesome. Uh, so here's a, Actually, you know what, let me go back for a second. So, yeah, as we see here, um, this is the JSON data. Here are the different headers. And at the top where it says response, this is the response that the server gave me. If you tab over to, I can't really see it from here. I think it says request somewhere there. Yeah, there it is. Um, <clears throat> you can tab over and see what request I sent. So now I can see say what did the app send and this is what it returned and now I can you know make my own assumptions based on the user-friendly uh, 
um, <clears throat> the user-friendly displayed URLs and design of REST, I can now do whatever I want because I see how it works. I'm authorized. I mean, if I wanted to hide myself by not using my actual user account, that would add another extra step of complexity, but not a big one. So, oh, and yeah. The, I was thinking like halfway through of my whole testing, like, oh, I wonder if they're going to see this because I'm not really trying to hide myself. And then at a certain point, I was like, I wonder if they're going to see me. Like, let me just not even try. Like, like let's, let's test out just how poor this is. Okay, so here's a, here's a screenshot of a REST client. Uh, this is the one that's built into PyCharm, and I really like it. This was really useful for uh, when I was coding because I would just make the request, see if it worked, and then like, okay, it did. Let's incorporate that into the code. Now, the end result, um, after repeated attempts to get in contact with the company, like I sent them emails, I filled out the contact form, they, I, I sent something to their security people, which, yeah, I'm kidding, they didn't have any of that stuff, yeah. Um, so anyway, eventually I finally uh, threatened to, not threaten, that's, I shouldn't use that word, but that's what it was, uh, to, I was like, I'm gonna disclose this without giving you guys a chance to fix it if you don't write back to me, because it's been like a week, this, I'm able to track 250,000 people around the world. Who, who else has been doing this for God knows how long? So um, that finally got their attention and they fixed it. And so the vulnerability was fixed, but I'm still single, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the conclusion on this is uh, apps often have poor server and or client side security. We're talking right now about server side security. I didn't even dive into the app itself because who needed to, the server piece was so easy, but at, the bar has been set so low to design apps that anybody can do it and everybody is doing it. And these people don't know anything about security. They're not security experts. They're not, you know, professional programmers. They're like, you know, there's a lot of teenagers doing this in their mom's basement and they get a really popular app, but you don't know what information is being leaked out from them. And a lot of the times it's not like somebody's doing something maliciously. This is just happening because they don't know what they're doing. Um, I spoke to the uh, head engineer at this app who was this one guy who I looked on his like LinkedIn stuff. His background was like a web developer. He does JavaScript stuff, like primarily. He makes really pretty stuff. He doesn't know about security, apparently. So, I, and you know, I didn't want to out him, so that's why I waited until they fixed all this stuff before disclosing any of it. But like, you know, they made an app. I think the company contracted this guy to make this app. He made it, it got popular and great, but they're not thinking like afterwards about security. We're, we're adding features, patch on security later, if ever. So REST um, in and of itself is an easy to use API uh, design which can easily be exploited if it's not properly secured and not because of any specific technical means but because uh, exploiting, exploiting apps that you don't know about or things like that is a lot easier when you can read exactly what it does. When it takes the guessing out of it, you don't need to say what the hell is this random string like, oh, get messages, I can infer what that means. Uh, be careful about what apps you use that use GPS. Like, fair enough. Um, okay, so this last slide is contact info, but I'm also going to open up the que uh, for questions. So you can reach me on Twitter at a green B H M or Drew Green on IT, um, DrewGreen.net, and here's my GitHub. Um, all right, and I'll take questions. Yes.
you know, every single time you have like a full user record, whether or not there was a message on the page that had it or not, they were just like, oh, we'll just send it in case there's a message in the browser that needs that new ID. Right. Uh, it's translate name. So you'll find all sorts of stuff in these things that will scare the bejesus out of you um, and or make you laugh your ass off. Right. But uh, I, I tell you, if you haven't ever dug into it, this is more, more of your life data is in these things than you think now. So. Yes. No, I, I do also want to add because, you know, Oh, it's hard to implement security. Uh, Parse has access control is available as part of the API that you can very easily add. In fact, that's exactly what the company did. They added ACLs to this um, rather quickly. So it wasn't some huge complex thing. So if they weren't doing that, you know, who else is missing out on that? And um, as, you, as you could see, I'll, the only information I needed was what was passed back to me a couple times, and that was my search. Those were my search parameters. Since uh, you know the, I mentioned the user URL. That's standard across all Parse accounts. Well, the rest of it is uh, you know custom classes that the app developer chooses. Well, they're not very well hidden because they get passed back to you, especially when you say include all user details. Now you got everything. So, any other questions? Yes. I honestly can't say I haven't used Burp in an automated capacity. Um, I usually just manually examine traffic. Uh, can anybody sure. speak to that? It's something that you ought to check out. Uh, like you mentioned some of the proxies. Now it's much harder because you were trying to go through a web app or through a, a phone app or whatever. But uh, like the Chrome extensions that you mentioned, there's one called Postman. The other one that you mentioned is also the Advanced Rest Client or whatever. They'll actually have little toggles you can enable them. So there's one called Postman. And that'll be the one that I would advise you to look. And it has like an extension you can launch and it will actually man in the middle of your own browser, but you don't have to worry about, you know, because you're doing it to yourself. It's just like the Burp extension. It's essentially the same kind of thing. But it will pre-build every API request that it finds that you do. So if you're just like on a website, just launch that joker and just browse around, and it'll build the requests and everything for you, put them in a little format like in your, like you showed in your IDE that you can edit the parameters and everything. And it literally makes life, I mean, you can go to like websites and try changing prices things like that if you want to. I'm not saying it'll work, it's just, it, it's a great way to play around with what they are and how to interact with them and, uh, and test stuff. I, I have something to add to that that just came up the other day. A friend of mine who lives in the Charlotte area, apparently just outside Charlotte, I don't know the area too well, is Huntersville, does that sound right? Apparently he lives there, but he's technically Charlotte, but his address is Huntersville. He wanted a Google Fiber shirt really badly. So um, apparently uh, it was rejecting it though because he didn't have a Charlotte address. So he explored the JavaScript on that forum page and apparently he found if you just change the, you know, say one where it says zero or something like that, you know, spoof, uh, yes, Charlotte, and he got his free shirt. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's amazing what you can find if you just look. People count, or the developers count on you not looking. It's not any kind of black magic. It's just using, you know, like the uh, developer tools in Chrome. Yeah, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll tell this for like hogging so much of the conversation, but the one other thing I'd say is like the authentication piece, the header tokens and things like that that you mentioned. A lot of times you'll think that you need cookies. You know, you have to like establish a oh, session right. or have, you know, have a cookie or something like that. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. You have that token. <laughs> Exactly. That's that's the uh, stateless piece of REST. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. I 
I personally do not know any off the top of my head, except I, I do know if it was doing cert pinning based on the first cert that it got, if you wiped the app data, or not app data, but you, you know, I guess app data, on, in this case, that would probably work. Um, does anybody have a, an answer for that? How do you, like, say you can't, or say it's built into the app. Does anybody know of a way to get around that? So somebody recently published, and I can't think of who it is off the top of my head, I have it pinned. If you, for Android specifically, you can do the Android code, you can patch the apps okay. so that they no longer get transcription. Gotcha. Is that using like Smalley or something like that? Or? Any other questions? All right, thanks a lot, guys.